While reading and living stoicism, how do you avoid spending too much time thinking about the inevitability of death and how do you harness it to empower you rather than scare or overwhelm you? So let's begin with a definition of terms. Stoicism or Stoic philosophy, very simply, and this is gonna be simplified, is a philosophical system that focuses on separating the things you can control from the things you cannot control and then instills in your daily practice habits and exercises such that you can focus as much of your energy as possible on things you can control. Part of Stoicism is meditating on death, certain inevitabilities, and finding freedom in that instead of overwhelm. All right, that sounds very nice and theoretical and conceptual. What does that mean in practice? I spend an amount of time that might seem ridiculous reminding myself of death. And this sounds morbid, but it is very valuable to me because it emphasizes the impermanence and the short duration of life that we have, which gives me a sense of urgency to pursue the things that are important. It gives me a sense of urgency in having the uncomfortable conversations that are so important in life, that can define the next chapters of your life, that can change your life. And without a sense of urgency, when you sort of cover your eyes and ears to not think about death, it is easy to push things off to tomorrow, to tomorrow, to tomorrow, until you die <laughs> and it's too late and you would have benefited from asking those uncomfortable questions, taking those uncomfortable actions far sooner. So I have, for instance, a memento mori coin made by a friend of mine and author, Ryan Holiday, well known for his writing on stoicism, which acts as a visual reminder. I have different quotes that are laser etched onto driftwood that also serve this purpose. And for that reason, I, I don't try to avoid spending too much time thinking about the inevitability of death. And the way that at least I find it empowering instead of overwhelming is to recognize A, it's outside of your control. B, it happens to everyone. And C, you can control in a sense or hone your perception of death and view it as a catalyzing help as opposed to a, an overwhelming sadness. And one practice that might seem unusual that I have found very valuable, and that is a famous sage once said, the only question worth asking is, what are you unwilling to feel? So as you think about death and how you relate to death, you may also think about how you relate to other emotions you don't want to feel. For me, particularly with a history of depression, I optimized for positive, 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 positive. Meaning, I wanted as many moments in my day to be purely positive as possible. I did not want to feel sad, I did not want to feel tired, I did not want to feel angry, so on and so forth. Those emotions are going to surface, and when you have labeled them as bad and try to refuse them with as much mental willpower and emotional willpower as possible, what you resist tends to persist. And those things have an outsized impact on your life, negative impact. Conversely, if you use, and here's the practice, say minor key music, which I had not used until a few years ago. Didn't listen to minor key music and just look up minor key piano music to get a taste for what this sounds like it instills melancholy, it has a sad sound to it. And I've, I've begun listening to music that evokes that type of feeling deliberately because at the end of listening to this music for say five to 10 minutes, and then you play another track that has a more upbeat feeling to it, say a lot of bossa nova from Brazil, you realize that the sadness, much like excitement, is transient and that your psyche is porous in that sense. The excitement flows into you and then it flows out of you. Not literally, but of course that is the subjective experience. And that's also true of sadness, which a lot of us try to avoid. 
And when you realize how transient that is and how you can turn it on and turn it off with cues in your environment, it becomes less intimidating, it becomes less overwhelming. You can use films in the same way, watching films that are scary, sad, depressive, whatever it might be, and then contrasting that with something that is on the opposite end of the spectrum. That is a practice, in other words, seeking out artistic cues that catalyze emotions historically you've tried to avoid that transcends the practice itself and helps you to relate differently to things like death. Because most likely what you fear or what you find um, abhorrent is not so much death itself, but the way that you're emotionally relating to the concept or definition of death. Similarly, uh, there are questions you can ask that I think show you or showcase the value of keeping death in mind. Such as uh, one question, and I'm gonna paraphrase this, this is from Munib Ali, and I believe the question I asked him was, what do you do when you feel scattered or overwhelmed? And his response, and Munib, I apologize if I'm not getting this uh, completely right. When you are experiencing something simple, laying in a warm bed. Uh, an example that comes to mind for me is laying in a hammock, watching my dog Molly play with a stick. When you are on your deathbed, how much would you pay? Or even 20 years from now, how much would you pay to relive this experience right now? And very often that number gets quite high. Maybe it's something that you physically might not be able to do 30 years from now, 40 years from now. I was just skiing a few days ago and had a wonderful experience with two of my closest friends. What would I pay 40 years from now to have that day back and experience that? And think about it. Don't throw away that question and uh, make up a number. Really think about what you might spend. And I think that highlights the value of experience relative to this decay that we all experience past a certain point on our descent to death. And uh, those are a few of the ways that I try to harness mortality to empower and enrich my life as opposed to disabling or distracting, if that makes sense. So those are a few tips, a few recommendations that have been deeply helpful to me. And if you'd like to learn more about Stoicism, then I would suggest you Google Tao of Seneca, T-A-O of Seneca. Seneca being one of the foremost writers or best known writers as it relates to Stoic philosophy.